soldiers in the 18th century, whether they be American, British, or French, all had very similar rations. Congress in 1775 established uh, rations for the American soldiers, and that ration stayed very similar for 150 years. Let's take a look at what was included in that ration. There were several different types of rations. There were per man, per day food rations that each man hoped he would get. There were uh, rations uh, per man per week, and then there were uh, per company per week rations. So the daily ration would include a meat component, usually a pound of beef or three quarters of a pound of pork or possibly a pound of salt fish. So another part of the daily ration would be the bread part. Each man was supposed to get a, a pound loaf of bread per day. And if bread wasn't available, then they would possibly be issued just, just flour. And if flour wasn't available, then they might even get a substitution of cornmeal. And to round out this daily ration, they were given a pint of milk and a quart of beer. The per company per week ration included candles, soap, items that the men would need that weren't food items. The per man per week rations were items that weren't as popular or common. Um, peas, it might also include beans, rice, or vinegar. Whenever possible, the soldiers would also supplement their diet with whatever items they could, they could procure locally uh, from the local village or from farmers or even from the wilderness around them. So in the following video series, we're going to take all these uh, ration items and we're going to prepare them in an 18th century fashion. Soldiers in the 18th century commonly had short rations and uh, they would supplement their rations. And one of the things they would supplement their rations with was pumpkins or sometimes they were called pompions. Today we're gonna take some pumpkins and we're gonna uh, cook them in a couple of different ways. So these uh, first two pumpkins we're going to roast. One I'm going to uh, turn into a pottage and another one we're gonna stuff with uh, pears. Let's start with our pottage pumpkin. I'm gonna take out the, the uh, pith and the seeds. Now we're gonna take this flat rock that we've had in the uh, fire for quite a while. I, it's got a nice flat side to it. I'll place those down and then heap coals on top of them. So this little pumpkin isn't gonna take very long at all to cook up. But in the meantime, while that's working, let's work on our other pumpkin. So I've got a pair here we're dicing up that we're gonna to use to stuff our pumpkin with. So if you've got some spices, a little bit of salt and a little bit of cinnamon is the perfect time. We're gonna put these on our top of our pears here. There we go. And mix that up a little bit. I'm gonna take our pumpkin and just cut the top of it off. Okay, so that's our pumpkin cleaned out. We're gonna take our, uh, our pear uh, dices, stuff that full. Just so that it'll fill up that cavity. On the very top, I'm going to place some of my precious butter. There we go. And then we're going to place our top back on. So here's our pumpkin. It's ready to go, ready to start by the fire. Um, we've got it all stuffed. And we're going to find a place nice right by the fire and let it bake on one side. And we'll slowly rotate it. As it, uh, as it cooks so that it gets evenly cooked all the way around. So while that pumpkin's cooking, uh, let's get started on our last one. 
So not all pumpkins could be used when they were ripe. There's one account of a soldier who, coming off the battlefield, finds a pumpkin, he finds it green, and he uh, slices it up and fries it. So that's what we're gonna do with this one. So with this green pumpkin, got it sliced up, we're going to fry it with a little bit of butter and add just a little bit of sugar to sweeten it up. A little bit of salt along with the sugar and pumpkin loves a little bit of cinnamon. Let's get some uh, butter in our pan and get that warmed up. Well, you got to keep these moving while you're while they're cooking or else that uh, sugar will burn in there but uh, these have softened up and they look like they're ready to go very tasty let's see how our other pumpkins doing so these little uh, pumpkins have only been on the fire for 10 or 15 minutes and they look like they're all ready so we're gonna take them off and they're nice and soft on the inside So while this is still hot, I'm gonna take some butter and uh, melt that in there and then add some milk and it should be ready to go. Maybe a little bit of salt. It's really good. A little bit of cinnamon really set it off. Let's see how our other pumpkin's doing. I think our uh, pumpkin's done roasting here. Let's take this away from the fire to cool just a little bit. Get all of the pears out. See, they've been roasting well in there. Okay. Well, there we've got most of it out. Are we, if you've got it, you might want to add just a little bit of butter, maybe even a little bit more salt. Should be ready to go. Three wonderful, simple ways that 18th century soldiers could cook their uh, pumpkin, a pumpkin pottage, a stuffed roast pumpkin, and my favorite, the uh, fried green pumpkin. It's very common for soldiers in the 18th century, especially when they were on the march, they'd be issued uh, their, their rations uh, maybe several days ahead of time. Uh, they'd be issued uh, several days of meat, and then they'd be issued uh, their, their flour, their bread ration. And because they were gonna be uh, gone for a while, uh, they would likely be given just flour instead of bread, as that would just go bad. And so there they were on the march with uh, not very much equipment to use, and all they had was flour, and they'd have to make some kind of food with it. Today we're going to make a fire cake or ash cake, uh, a very, very simple uh, thing that the soldiers would be able to make with just the flour and a little bit of water. So what are we going to need to make ash cake? Well, number one, we're going to need to have good ashes. We're going to have to have a really nice ash bed to work with, good and hot. So we don't have very much equipment. Uh, we're going to uh, try to do this with uh, three different uh, methods. We're going to use a simple uh, bannock board, or if you don't have a, a board like this, maybe you could just use a, uh, a half split of, of firewood uh, that's nice and flat. We're also going to use a method uh, where we put leaves around our our uh, fire cake or our ash cake. Uh, so all you're gonna need for that is some, some large leaves, like a grape leaf or a large tree leaf, um, a burdock or, or cabbage leaves, something like that. And the last method, uh, we're not gonna use anything at all. We're just gonna make our cake and we're gonna place them right on the coals. 
So now our coals are getting really close to being ready to use. Let's make up our dough. I've got a uh, simple wooden bowl here for us to make our dough in, the flour that we've been issued. And I'm gonna make up uh, three or four ash cakes here. If you have any salt available to you, which the soldiers may or may not have had, had salt that day or that particular time, but uh, salt will add a lot to the taste of your uh, fire cakes. So in this case, we're going to add a good bit of salt to it. And we're gonna stir that around while our, while our ingredients are still dry. So it'll be easy to mix. And now we're gonna need some water. You wanna add enough water to make a stiff paste. And we're going to start out with maybe a little less than we need so that we don't go overboard. For the uh, ash cakes that we're gonna cook on the, uh, on the bannock board, uh, we're going to uh, get this to be a little stickier because we need to uh, stick it to the board. It needs to stay there while it's cooking. Okay, we've got our uh, dough mixed up. It's uh, nice and the right kind of consistency. Uh, a little stiff, but still uh, sticky enough to work with. And I've got this. We're gonna take this one, we're gonna flatten it out on our bannock board. We're gonna get it nice and, and uh, thin. The thinner, the better it's going to cook. We need to make sure that it's sticky enough that it sticks to the board. Our board's got two holes in it uh, so that we can prop it up. Let's uh, put this up by the fire and let this cook while I'm working on the other ones. Okay, we got the fire banked up a little bit higher on this spot and I'm gonna place the board. I don't wanna get it too close so it catches on fire, but I can feel the heat here. That feels pretty good. Got our little stick here. Prop it up at an angle. And that feels really good. We're gonna let that cook. Let's use leaves for our next uh, fire cakes. I'm gonna keep watching that one to make sure it doesn't burn, but here's, a, here's our next fire cake. Let's take out a dough section here, and we're gonna make it into a, uh, a patty. We don't make it as thin as that, but, you know, thin-ish. We're gonna uh, make it uh, in relationship to the size of our, our leaves. I've got here uh, some, um, some wild grape leaves and a, uh, some cottonwood leaves. Uh, depending on the time of the year, you know, different leaves are gonna work better than other ones, but you want a nice big leaf that's gonna protect your a little fire cake. So let's use a grape leaf on the inside because a little bit of the taste does end up on the fire cake. We're gonna put grape leaves on the inside and then do a extra, little extra protection because the leaves are gonna slowly burn through. Now we're gonna put the, uh, the cottonwood leaves on. And I've got a really nice uh, coal section here. We're just gonna place this uh, right onto the coals. Since it's got the coals right on top and below it, it's not gonna take that long to cook. Three, four, maybe five minutes. Uh, that's something you're going to judge. You're not going to be able to tell. So it, it takes a little experience to know uh, when that when it's ready to come out. The ash bed is really important that you're cooking on. Uh, if your ashes are gray, they're probably uh, already too cool to do any cooking on, like these uh, this color. Uh, this white hot ash over here, whew, it's really warm. Uh, that's the kind of ash we're cooking with, uh, the stuff that's still white. If it's gray, it's gotten too cold to cook with. A bannock board uh, a biscuit looks like it still needs a little bit of time to cook. It's, it's not even, it's, I'll have to turn it over pretty uh, shortly, but this one's probably ready to come out. It's, it's been about four minutes or so. I'm just gonna lightly scrape off our ashes from the top. And I'm gonna scoop the whole patty out. And there it is. Let's put it on top of this board so we can see how it turned out. There we are. Feels like this one's just about done. I could have probably left it in another minute or two, but it's still hot. It's still cooking. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, set this off to the side where it'll stay warm, but it's still hot, so it's still cooking on the inside. Our bannock board uh, uh, fire cake over here, you can see it's starting to brown up along the bottom side, so I'm gonna go ahead and rotate the board so the other side of the, uh, the top side of it can cook. I 
we want to be real gentle when we turn this over so that we don't knock the, the thread off. And I'm going to tilt this a little bit further, ouch, so that, because our coals are getting a little cooler, but they're still really warm right there, so it should cook right up. Well, let's try our fire cake where we actually put it directly on the coals. If we don't have good leaves to work with, um, we can just try cooking our fire cake right on the coals. It's going to char up on the outside, but that's all we have to work with, so let's do it. And we're going to place it right on the coals here. I've got a nice hot uh, section of coals. We're going to place it right on there. I'm going to use my tomahawk because this fire is hot. There we go. And I'm going to find some hot coals close by. And we're going to set them on top. We'll gent lightly and gently bury it in hot coals. I'm not going to bury it completely. I don't want to lose it in the fire. I want to be able to see around the edges just a little bit so we can watch it cooking. Well, it looks like our, our bannock board uh, fire cake is ready to pull off. It's uh, browned up all over on the outside so we're going to go ahead and pull this off the board and uh, put it onto our plate. may be tough to get off, but this one came off. Now you can see it's still a little uh, damp on that side, cooked uh, completely on that side. I, I call that done. Well, our bannock bread's off, the other one's out. It smells like our uh, ash cake that's cooking right here in the coals is probably ready to, to pull out too. So let's, let's pull it out. Look at that, dusty ashes off the top. We still got some that are sticking to the bottom. This gently might still be hot coals, so I'm not gonna touch them. A little bit of ash is known to, uh, to calm your di digestive tract, so the ash isn't gonna hurt you a bit. And that, it looks really good for cooking right there in the coals. So there you have it. You got the three different kinds of ash cake or fire cake. We've got our bannock board cake, uh, the one we cooked right in the ashes, and then the uh, one we used uh, the leaves for protection. Let's try these out. Definitely very edible. I think I'll have them for supper tonight. As we talked about in uh, earlier videos, uh, pork was one of the most common and popular meats in the 18th century. It was one of the, uh, the uh, meats that would be uh, supplied in rations. Uh, for soldiers, uh, it was a common thing for sailors and, and the entire population. Uh, pork was salted so that uh, so that it would last any number of months and could be transported, used in ships. The sailors could eat it later on. Today we're going to show you a method for uh, salting and preserving your pork in an 18th century manner. Salting is an ancient technique, even, even previous to the Romans, very easily documented. There are a, a di couple different variations of salting. Sometimes they would just uh, pack their meat in uh, salt water or a brine. Uh, sometimes they'd hard pack it with uh, lots of salt. And then there's even uh, adding saltpeter to it for a, a more deeper uh, preservation technique that might uh, last a little bit longer, but didn't taste as well. Today, we're going to prepare our salt pork in this uh, two gallon oak. Uh, keg. This one is a uh, is a well bucket keg that uh, we sell at James Townsend and Son. This this doesn't have the holes drilled in it. You can ask for a keg like that if you want to do a, a similar project. Uh, this one has been touched up on the inside. We took a torch and melted out the uh, the excess wax here at the top, and we also uh, prepared a little wooden uh, lid so that will press down on the pork, keep it inside the brine solution. Before we get started packing our meat, we need a, a, a hot brine solution prepared. There's a common misconception that uh, salt pork is uh, easy to come by these days. You'll find something in a modern grocery store uh, that's called salt pork, but in reality it's, it's nothing like what uh, was known as salt pork in the 18th century. This is, is just a, a cured but unsmoked uh, pork belly product, but it isn't uh, actually prepared in a manner that 18th century salt pork was. So rather than use a pork belly, we're going to use a, a pork shoulder or this is a, a, a picnic. 
I've got our pork uh, already cut up into about one pound size pieces. We gotta have it so we can put it in in layers so the salt can get into it. So we got one pound pieces here. We're gonna put about a, uh, a cup of salt into our, into our uh, a barrel here so that uh, we've got a layer of salt in the very bottom. We're gonna spread that out, make sure it's nice and even. And now we're gonna start putting our pork into the barrel. We've got uh, rind pieces on this. These rinds, we wanna make sure are toward the bottom or toward the outside edges with the, the meat parts uh, on the inside. You wanna pack this tight. You wanna have as uh, small a quantity of air pockets as possible. Each time we put in another layer of meat, we put in another layer uh, of salt. Make sure that's all spread out evenly. It's tightly packed and we add more salt. You can't add too much salt, so don't worry about getting too much salt in this. Better to have too much than too little. That's our final piece of meat. The keg is pretty much full. There's still uh, some space there at the top. Uh, the final step here is going to be uh, pouring the hot brine solution. Now, that will fill in all the gaps and uh, seal it up, and then we'll put our lid on. So a method in the 18th century to see whether our brine solution was briny enough was to float an egg. This is a, just a regular raw egg, uh, still in the shell, and we can see that uh, this egg is floating in the solution, so we know it's, it's thick enough. There's enough salt in here. Here's our hot brine solution. We know that it's uh, thick enough. We're gonna start pouring it on, in on top until it completely covers our meat. And then it's time for your wooden lid. We're gonna float that up on top. And then finally, to make sure that this lid presses down on top of the meat, we're gonna place a weight on top. If we see some frothing, uh, that means something's going on. We need to take care of that. You need to uh, pour the uh, brine solution off. You need to scald the brine solution, then you can put it back on again. Well, our keg is ready to store now. In the 18th century, it was traditional to process uh, pork and beef uh, products when they salt it. They would uh, uh, do that in the fall when the temperatures were cool. It would make this uh, last a lot longer. Uh, that's the same thing we're gonna do. We're gonna take this keg and we're gonna put it in the refrigerator uh, to keep it nice and cool so that it doesn't go bad. Uh, it will probably last and, and be good for several weeks uh, put in a cool place like that. In the 18th century, they would, they would use it all through the winter uh, into the next spring. When it comes time to use your salt pork, you can pull it out of the barrel, uh, you need to soak it. You need to soak it sometimes overnight, but at least two hours. You wanna soak it in fresh water, changing the water often, so that you get as much salt out of that uh, pork as possible. You're never gonna get it all, it's gonna be a, a salty thing. But other than that, you use it like you would any fresh cut. You can use it in any recipe. So today we're going to take a, a common soldier's ration and we're going to turn it into three different meals, a soup, a stew, and a hash. The uh, foundation of our stew and our hash, we're going to use salt pork. And the foundation for the stew, we're going to use fresh beef. So the salt pork we're using today is uh, salt pork that we've prepared in an 18th century manner. Uh, when it's time to use the salt pork, you have to soak it. You have to take several hours, uh, soak it in water, change the water out, uh, soak it again until it's ready to, to use. If you don't soak it several times and get all the salt out, uh, it's, it's inedible. So uh, the big difference between a soup and a stew is how much water we use when we prepare it. And the first thing we have to do is to get this water going, get it boiling. I've got six pints of water started boiling here for the uh, soup, and I've got three pints for the stew. Let's start out with our soup. While our six pints of water is getting ready to boil here, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to brown our salt pork in a little bit of fat. I'm going to let this set and sear a little bit. Browning this meat first will uh, release a lot of the flavors. So we're doing this in small batches. Uh, if we do too much at once, we can't, uh, we can't get it to caramelize properly. That releases too many juices. Once your uh, salt pork is browned, it's time to dump it in your boiling water. If any scum develops on the surface, uh, scrape that off. We're gonna let this boil about 15 minutes. 
Now that our uh, soup has uh, boiled about 15 minutes with the meat in it, it's time to add some other things. I've got some uh, carrots here and some parsnips. We're gonna add those. So there's the carrots, part of our parsnips. From our pocket spice kit, we need to use a little bit of salt and pepper. Oh, yeah, that's looking good. It's also now a good time to add um, a bay leaf if you've got it. And we've got a little bit of cider vinegar. Just a splash or two of cider vinegar will really set this off. Now that we've added these things to our soup, we're going to moderate the fire a little bit and let it simmer for about an hour. Now that our uh, soup has uh, simmered about an hour, it's uh, time to throw in some cabbage if we've got it. And I've also got a little bit of rosemary and thyme. I've got a little bundle here that I'm gonna throw in. You don't wanna put this stuff in too soon or, or it'll destroy the flavors. Uh, many period recipes for uh, soup like this will call for uh, bread to be uh, uh, cubed up and tossed in at the end, kind of like dumplings. We're going to let this simmer for uh, another 15 minutes. this recipe, I've got about a half a pound of dried peas here. We soaked these overnight so they're going to be ready to cook. So I'm starting out with about a half a pound of beef here. This should go really nicely with our peas. Coating this meat with flour and then browning it will help thicken up the stew. So now that our uh, beef is well browned, we're going to add that to our three pints of uh, boiling stew water, and then we're going to add our peas. So let's get this beef in there without losing any of it. Ah. There we go. And now we're going to add the peas. So now that our stew's boiled for about 15 minutes, we're going to add some potato. Uh, some onion and some parsnips, along with some salt and pepper. We're going to let that simmer for about an hour. You'll know this stew is ready when the peas break down and the stew thickens up. And that really is a matter of how long you've, uh, you've soaked your peas. Uh, if you haven't soaked them at all, this might take two or three hours. But if you soak them, it won't take as long. While our soups and stews are simmering here, let's start the hash. Our hash is a fairly simple dish. I've got some uh, uh, finely diced salt pork here. I've already browned this up with some onion. And I'm going to take a couple of uh, parboiled or already boiled uh, potatoes. I'm going to uh, dice these up and mash them, put them in with that. We also need to add a little bit of milk to give it uh, some liquid to work with. If you happen to have some allspice, it makes a wonderful addition to the hash. I'm gonna form this up into patties and fry it in our frying pan. Well, there we have all three dishes finished. We've got a uh, salt pork soup, and uh, the salt pork really has a wonderful flavor. Um, the saltiness balanced out with the uh, other flavors. Actually, extremely uh, good. Here's our salt pork hash. Uh, it may not look great, but let me tell you, it is my favorite on the uh, table here. The salt pork, very tender just the right amount of saltiness, and along with the potatoes and the onions, definitely a favorite. So the last dish here was the, uh, the stew. This is uh, the uh, beef and the peas uh, stew, and it thickened up rather nicely. The, um, the peas add their own kind of sweetness to it. Uh, the beef is excellent. 
in here. Um, any one of these things uh, you will definitely enjoy. In our past episodes, we've covered what a, a soldier would do with his, his daily ration, his ration of one pound of, of meat, and one pound of bread, his, uh, his a little bit of beer and a little bit of milk. But a number of journals and diaries of soldiers uh, suggest that uh, extreme want, famine, was much more common than plenty. In Jeremiah Greenman's diary, he speaks of one occasion during a Quebec campaign here we were in a miserable situation, nothing to eat but dogs. Here we killed another. I got some of that by good luck. And with the head of a squirrel and a parcel of candle wicks, I boiled them up together, which made a very fine soup without salt. And here we made a noble feast without bread or salt, thinking it was the best that I'd ever had eaten. And so I went to sleep contented. On another occasion he wrote, this morning when we arose, Many of us were so weak that we could hardly stand, and we staggered around like drunken men, and I happened to get a pint of water that a partridge had been boiled in. In Joseph Plum Martin's book, he uh, relates one uh, story about a Thanksgiving where their entire ration was nothing but a gill of rice and a tablespoon of vinegar. That's what we're going to cook today. A gill of rice is about a quarter of a cup. Here I've got uh, two man's rations. I bit a bit of good providence, I, I came onto this uh, bit of candle. I'll add it to our feast. And finally, we'll add our tablespoon of vinegar because we have no salt. Happy Thanksgiving, Josh. We realize this is a departure from our normal theme, but we just wanted to give you a taste of what it was really like for soldiers in the 18th century. Here's to better days, Josh. In this video, we're gonna show you how to build an earthen oven. The existence of ovens like this uh, is easily documented for the 18th century. In fact, just about every ancient culture had a very similar oven. There's one particular woodcut illustration from medieval times depicting an earthen oven built on a wagon. There are references in 18th century literature uh, and also archaeological evidence that you would find ovens like this in private homes and uh, in fort settings. There are also references to communal ovens where the baker would bake bread for an entire village. As part of our video series on 18th century cooking, we're going to show you how to uh, build a earthen oven just like this one. We're going to need several things to make our mud oven out of. We're going to need sand. That's the uh, major component of our uh, oven. We're going to need a good bit of clay. This is dried clay you can get at a masonry store or you can get a damp clay out of a ditch banker. You're going to need straw or dried grass or um, uh, maybe hay. You may need some bricks, so some fire bricks, even, even regular bricks will work. And you're going to need a canvas tarp to mix your cob together with and you're definitely going to need a good bit of water. Before you build your oven, you have to consider what you're going to build your oven on. There are historical examples of uh, ovens built on tables or on brick or stone uh, plinths on hearths. On the top of our very sturdy table, we've laid out a layer of fire brick. That's going to be the floor of our oven. We've also chalked out here 
the design about 22 inches across at the bottom on the inside. That's the inside measurement. It's going to be the walls are going to be about six inches thick. So we've got markings here so we can see about how big it's going to look on the surface. The uh, door width right here is about 12 inches across so we can get something as big as a pie in without too much trouble. First thing we're going to do is we're going to build the core. It's going to be like a sand castle, just wet sand that we're going to build the oven over the top of. Sometimes you'll see other people doing it with sticks and things like this. This is going to be much easier and quicker. We've got, this is where our door is going to be. I just went ahead and put a couple bricks in here to be the inner core of the door. They'll be removed. Um, and right here I've, I've placed a brick wall to uh, give us a nice flat surface to build up against. So we've taken about an hour to put this together. We've used very wet sand so that it stays into shape. Now we've got to make sure that this stays wet till we get our first layer on. There aren't very many critical things about the shape and the size of your particular oven, but there is one critical thing, and that is the height of the opening tunnel here compared to the height of your dome. Uh, these need to be a particular ratio or else the air won't draw through this when you're uh, burning uh, the wood inside of the thing. So this is a, a, a between 65 and 60 percent or about 63 percent height here compared to the height there. The next thing we're going to do is put paper on this. We're going to put paper, we're going to wet it down so it'll give us a layer to separate so when we take the uh, sand out uh, it doesn't stick to the inner surface. Got the uh, paper covering done on our uh, sand inner core. This will make it much easier to uh, take the uh, core out from underneath it. Uh, now it's time to make the uh, first layer of cob or mud to put on our oven. This innermost layer of mud or, or cob that we're going to put on our oven is just sand and clay. Uh, about two parts sand to one part clay. We mix those two together so that they're very well mixed and then we just uh, put it on there. We want to make sure it's about, got about the right consistency that we can still work it, but it isn't so wet that it's sloppy. Um, and you want to make sure to have uh, air on the side of a little more sand than too much clay. The more clay you've got, the more it's going to shrink and crack. So you probably want to make up a bunch of this cob beforehand. Uh, it ages well. It won't, it won't go bad waiting overnight. And that way, as soon as you're done with your sandcastle core, you can start putting it on right away and you don't have to worry about that drying out and blowing away while you're making your cob. So learning just the right consistency, that can be a trick. As you see here, I've been stomping on this pile for a little while and this is starting to feel really good. It forms up into a, a, a ball, like a snowball. It doesn't deform easily, it's not sloppy. You can still form it into uh, any shape you want and it's not too uh, drippy either. That's what you're looking for, something that holds together well, but still moldable. So we're working on putting this first layer on. This is a, a layer without any straw in it because that would just burn up anyway. It's about three inches thick and we're starting at the very bottom. We're gonna work our way up. That way we can watch as we go to make sure our thickness stays about the same. Well, we finished the, uh, the inner mud layer yesterday afternoon, and we let this set overnight. And it's, uh, it's just slightly firmer than it was. We don't want to let it get too dry or else the next layer won't adhere to this layer properly. We've uh, scratched this layer a little bit so that the uh, next layer of cob we put on here will adhere nicely. This next layer of cob that we put on, it's going to have uh, grass or hay or straw in it to give it a lot more strength than this inner layer. We're gonna mix our clay and our sand first. As Soon as that's getting close to the right consistency, that's when we'll add our other uh, binder material here. So, I've got this mixed up. I'm gonna uh, mix this up just slightly wetter. Uh, it's feeling uh, like a pretty good consistency now under my feet. And since, since we're going to add in this dry straw here, it's going to dry it up a little bit. So I'm going to start with a slightly wetter uh, mixture. But we wanted to get this mixed first and then add in the binder. 
This will add some amazing strength to it. When it dries up, it really binds it together. So it's helpful to make this cob up beforehand. Uh, it really makes it work better if it's uh, a couple days old, but you don't want to let it get too old because as it's uh, wet for a long time, the grass will start to rot in there. So you don't want that to happen. If it's a day or two old, keep it wrapped in plastic so it's wet and pliable. It'll really work even better after a day or two. So to make this go faster, I suggest you invite a bunch of friends over. Have a cob party. They can be stomping on this stuff while you're putting it on your stove. Everyone will have fun. Well, I've got about uh, five or six uh, loaves of, uh, big loaves of, of cob here ready to go. I think that's a good start. I'm not sure exactly how many it's gonna take to cover this oven, so we're gonna uh, put this on, and then I'll see how much more I need to make. I've got uh, marks here on the table to uh, get about uh, two and a half or three inches for the outside layer. We're gonna start putting on our loaves. We're gonna make sure that they butt up well with the uh, inner core here so there isn't a big airspace between them and I'll just start adding these on all the way around. Okay, there it is. We've got the second uh, layer of a cob type material on here. This is the stuff with the straw that's that's built into it. Uh, it does, as you work it, it kind of sags down some. So you might want to start a little thinner at the bottom than the finish, expecting some of it to sag down into position a little bit. This gives us a good opportunity to look at the cross section about what's going on here. You can see the cob's a little thicker down at the bottom than it is at the top because it's kind of sagged a little bit. You can see our outer cob core, our inner core that uh, doesn't have this straw in it, and here's the, the sand core on the inside. We're going to add um, a little bit to the outside here. We're going to give it a nice rounded opening because the rounded opening is going to have more strength than this uh, sharp edge. Well, we've uh, finished putting our rounded opening on the oven, so it'll be a, a little bit stronger. We made sure to, to uh, uh, mate the, the, the cob that we added back into this other stuff. Whenever you add two pieces together, you really have to work it so that the two pieces adhere to each other and it just doesn't fall off. We added a little bit of sand on the front uh, to help support that lip. Um, depending on where you're at, your environment, the time of year, uh, what the humidity is, this will take two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, maybe even a little longer for it to get dry enough uh, for it to even, you start to even think about warming it up from the inside. While this is drying, you don't want to, to get it rained on. So you're gonna need to protect this from the weather, but don't uh, cover it with plastic so that it can't dry. So you wanna protect it from the rain, but let it breathe. So it's only been about 24 hours since we've been here last, but. It's uh, firmed up enough with uh, how the weather is here that we were able to go ahead and pull out some of the sand. I haven't gone and dug the whole thing out, but I want to let it uh, start to dry out on the inside and even peel off some of the paper if you want to, but that'll all burn out anyway. But we are just uh, dug it out about halfway. We'll come back in a couple more days to take out more. We've removed the sand core from this oven and we've given it a couple weeks to dry so it's almost ready to fire. You may not have to wait this long if you build an oven, but you, if it's not adequately dry before you fire it, it'll cause cracking or at least more cracking than normal in the body. Even if you wait like we did, uh, it's inevitable that some cracking will occur. Don't be alarmed. If the cracks are especially big, you can repair them with a little extra sand and clay and, and let that dry in place. We've employed a few warming fires in this oven and it's, and it's dried out well. We've gotten a few cracks, but overall we're really pleased. The walls of this oven are extremely durable. Here's a, a brick of the material and it takes a lot to uh, break this material up. So if you need to do modifications, you'll really have to chop at it. Um, however, is, as sturdy as this is, it still needs to be protected from the weather. This is water soluble and it'll just wash away with the rain. So 
we need this to last a while, we're going to have to build a little roof over it. Make sure to watch part two of this video where we uh, learn how to bake bread in one of these earthen ovens. You know, this looks pretty good. I think I'm going to fire it up. So in the uh, first video, we showed you how to build uh, one of these earthen ovens. We covered that completely. This one's uh, finally dried out and ready to use. So let's, let's bake some bread. We're going to start with a small warming fire. This is a small fire with sticks that we're going to uh, fire up right inside the door of the oven. As soon as that is going well, I'm going to push that to the back and then add some more wood to it. The drier the wood, the better. While this oven's heating up, let's talk about the tools we're going to need for baking. We're going to need a few tools to do the baking in our oven. Uh, we're going to need a rooker or something similar, uh, almost like a hoe. This is a, a tool we can use to rake the coals out of the oven or push them into the back. Um, it needs to be metal so it doesn't, doesn't catch on fire. Um, after we move our, cool, uh, our coals, we need to use a, a scuffle or something similar. This is a rag mop that uh, you use in the water. It'll clean off the floor. It'll moisturize the inside of the oven. It'll cool off the floor just a little bit so we don't burn the bottom of our bread. <clears throat> You're going to need a, a peel. Uh, the peel is what we use to uh, put the dough into the oven with and to take the... Uh, Take the loaves out when we're done and you're going to need some sort of door that we can put on our oven that will trap the heat inside. So it's going to take one to two hours for this to warm up to get to temperature. Now while we could use a, uh, a thermometer to figure out whether we're at the, at the right temperature, it's probably just as easy with a little bit of practice to uh, learn a couple other ways to figure out what temperature it is. The first way is smoke. Ovens that aren't up to temperature yet will produce a good bit of smoke. Until the temperature inside reaches a certain point, the wood doesn't burn very efficiently. So once it's hot enough, we'll see less smoke. The second indicator is related to the first. As the oven's warming up, the interior will become covered in black soot. But as the oven reaches the proper baking temperature, the walls will change from black to gray as the soot is burnt to ash. We've had a fire going for about two hours in the oven here and I've let it burn down to coals. The black soot at the back, or in fact all over, has, has burnt down to ash. Um, if I feel the very top here, it's almost too hot to hold my hand on. That gives me a good idea. Each oven will be different in how much you're going to have to judge. Now what we're going to do is rake the coals out, put the door on and, and let it soak for a little bit. Soaking the oven gives the oven a chance to uh, even out in temperature over the whole thing so we don't have hot spots. We're going to let it set anywhere from 5 to 15 minutes. We've let this soak and uh, it's a possibility that this is still too hot. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a little handful of uh, corn meal and toss it on the floor if it uh, turns black or uh, catches on fire, then obviously it's still too hot on the inside. We can see some smoke coming off of this. It's probably still just a little too hot. What we're gonna do is we're gonna take our, our uh, scuffle and we're going to wet down the inside and let it soak just a little bit longer. We're gonna give the oven one quick swabbing with the scuffle. It's gonna clean out any ash on the floor. It's gonna cool the floor down just a little bit and it'll add a little moisture to the inside of the oven. Let's recheck the temperature of the oven, see if it's ready to go yet. A little bit of cornmeal, ooh, warming. It's uh, just turning light brown, so it looks like perfect temperature for baking. Just before we started up the oven, I uh, worked on some bread dough, and this has been rising, uh, so it's ready to put in the oven.
we're gonna let these bake 10 to 12 minutes. Well, while we're waiting for this to cook, um, there's usually a, a progression that you would use these ovens. Uh, you would wanna, as soon as it's, as it's up to temperature, you would wanna cook something that you'd need a hot oven for. Many times they'd cook pies uh, first, then they'd cook breads. When it cooled down a little bit after the breads were done, they'd cook things like cookies. Um, and then even after cookies, they'd still continue to use the heat. They might uh, cook beans after that for a long period of time. And even when it's even cooler, they can do things like uh, dry herbs uh, in their oven while it's still warm or even firewood for the next time they're going to use it. I can smell the bread even out here. I'll bet you it's ready to come out. And the loaves look really good. They look just right. Let's take them out. There they are. It's important you let your uh, loaves set for a little bit uh, while they're still warm. You want to let them cool off. They're actually still baking on the inside. If you cut them up now, they'll, they'll be a little doughy on the inside. Soldiers in the 18th century were given rations of meat, either uh, pork or beef, salt or fresh. Something else that they were given sometimes was fish, salted fish. So here we've got uh, some salted cod. We're going to uh, cook up into a very simple yet delicious meal. We've chosen salted fish today uh, because it's something you can take to an event that doesn't need to be refrigerated or cooled. Um, you can make a, an 18th century dish with it, and it's uh, something you can also purchase locally. If you go to a, a, a good um, grocery store, you're probably going to find these little uh, wooden boxes in the fish section, very similar to what they had in the 18th century. The salted fish right out of the box is uh, much too salty to uh, cook with. It needs to be soaked to draw the salt out, so the day before you want to use it, you want to start uh, soaking this. Uh, you want to change the water three or four times, and then after it's soaked overnight, it should be um, ready to use. So we've gone ahead and done some uh, preparation here. I've taken about six ounces of the cod and we've shredded it up into little pieces. And I also have some potatoes that I've already uh, boiled up so that they're just soft enough to mash. Uh, I've got about the same amount of potatoes here in the bowl as I do um, fish in the, in the bowl over there. We want about equal amounts and uh, I want this uh, mashed up nicely so it'll mix in with your fish. And the fish, something you have to remember about the fish is, number one, it may have bones or skin. And if, if you, uh, as you're tearing it up, if you find that there are any bones and skin, you want to discard that. Also, uh, you can soak it too long. If you soak it too long, it'll, it'll remove all the flavor um, and all the saltiness from the fish. So you want to taste it, make sure that it's not tasteless before you use it or else you're going to have to add some spices to bring that flavor back. Now let's take one egg and put that into our potatoes and uh, then we'll mix it in with our fish. If uh, potatoes weren't available uh, it's likely they would they would have tried to use uh, breadcrumbs or possibly flour as a good substitute for the potatoes. You want to make sure that your butter is nice and hot. See how we're doing here. Well, these, of course, were popular. They look like a great breakfast thing. They're, of course, they'd be eaten all day long. Uh, let's see how these turned out. I'm gonna cook up the rest of these. Ooh.
apples have been enjoyed for centuries by people. Apples were popular in the 18th century, and today the, uh, the dish, we're call, uh, dish we're making is called a Cheshire pork pie with pippins. Pippins is a common name for apples in the 18th century. In our recipe, we're going to be using uh, salt pork. This is true 18th century style uh, salt pork, not something like you might find in uh, your uh, grocery store uh, bacon shelf, but a leaner cut, a uh, hard packed in salt, uh, like we discussed in a, in a previous uh, video. And likewise, we've uh, sliced our, our pippins here and uh, they're uh, ready to use in our pie. As we make our pie, what we're gonna do is we're gonna put in a layer of pork, and then we're gonna put in a layer of apple. We're boiling our salt pork today for about an hour. Uh, because uh, we're boiling it, we don't need to, uh, to rinse it off quite as much as we normally uh, would have before using it. We're going to slice it thin, and then we're gonna season it with a little pepper. I've got our pie packed up here. Um, now it's time to add some spices to it. I'm gonna add some salt and some pepper to this to season it well, so it's got some flavor to it. All these things come right out of our spice kit. That's a little bit more there. There, that's good. Now we're gonna put in, uh, uh, put some uh, butter on top that will melt down into our, our pie here. We're gonna add about uh, two tablespoons of water to give it a little bit of moisture. Uh, the amount of water you use or you need to add to this pie totally depends on the kind of apple you use. If, if you use a Macintosh apple, uh, they'll turn to something like a applesauce. So you don't need to add very much water. If you have a firmer, crisper apple, you might need a little bit more water. So for pie apples, uh, if you've got any choice and you're not just picking off a local tree, if you go to the grocery store, you wanna look for Jonathan's or wine saps, uh, something that's particularly a pie apple, a tart yet sweet apple that, that, holds, its, uh, that holds together and doesn't turn to applesauce. Uh, what you don't want is a Red Delicious apple. Red Delicious apples are very 20th century. They've, they've been bred for their size and their color and not for their taste and they don't make a very good uh, pie apple at all. We're gonna put our uh, second uh, pie crust on here to cover this up. We're gonna trim and seal the edges. Now let's uh, cut a, some vent holes and work on the mock pigeon pie. Passenger pigeons were uh, one of the most populous birds in the 18th and 19th century. There were uh, billions of these birds on the planet. They were uh, almost a scourge. There were so many of them. They were very popular and yet you would find in a lot of recipes. There were so many of these birds that uh, there were reports of flocks that were a mile wide and 300 miles long that would take 14 hours to fly over. There would so many of them they'd blot out the sun. Obviously we can't use passenger pigeon today since since the last one died almost a hundred years ago. So today we're going to use uh, as our substitute, uh, Cornish game hen. We've uh, simmered two Cornish game hens uh, with onions, and then we've uh, picked the meat off, put them in the bowl. Now let's brown up a little bit of, of uh, flour in some butter. I'm gonna add some stock, let this simmer a little bit. We'll also season it with a little salt, pepper, and thyme. By the way, our uh, pie plates here are thrown by our master potter, uh, Gary Nieder, right here in Indiana, and they have a, a lead-free, uh, food-safe glaze. We're gonna put our uh, pulled meat into a, a pie crust. We're gonna pour our uh, warmed sauce on top of that, seal it up with the other pie crust, and it's ready to bake. We're gonna bake this mock pigeon pie in a Dutch oven. 
let's talk about these Dutch ovens for a minute. Dutch ovens uh, like this are a specifically 18th century and North American improvement on a 17th century design. The lip at the top is specifically designed to keep the coals from falling off, so the coals will stay on the top. And the legs at the bottom keep, uh, keep it so the air can flow underneath and, and uh, keep the coals alive underneath. We got our Dutch oven preheated. I've kind of left it in the fire pit here and it, it's good and warm, but we have to get our, our pit ready for this. We got our coals underneath. It's time to put the pie in. We need to keep the pie off the bottom of the Dutch oven, so we're gonna put a couple of uh, S hooks in here to space the pie pan off the bottom so the bottom doesn't burn. We got plenty of uh, space around the outside edge so we can reach in there without burning ourselves. Now let's put the lid on. Deciding exactly how many coals you want to use is, is a bit of a matter of judgment. Uh, each person is going to have to get um, uh, used to that. You need to practice. I put a ring of coals around the top of the lid here, leaving the open, uh, the center a little bit open. Same thing at the bottom. There's a little bit of opening at the very uh, center uh, to uh, not get it too hot. Each one of those is going to be just a little bit different, though. Let's check out our earthen oven and see if it's... Uh, it's ready for the pork pie. Okay, our uh, oven is uh, all baked down into coals. Our soot is burnt off, so this is ready to go. You can see about how to use the oven better in the uh, baking bread uh, video. Anyway, I'm gonna scrape the coals out and get this ready for the pie. I'm going to put S hooks inside uh, this one also to serve as a trivet. I don't want to burn the bottom. There we go. We're going to have to watch this. This one might be a little bit too hot, so we're going to keep an eye out on it. Let's put the door on though. It's been about uh, 10 or 15 minutes, and I think this is probably ready to go. If we take a quick look, whoa, <laughs> it's ready to come out. Let's, uh, I don't want to let it go too long. Wow, look at that. Looks just about perfect. Well, I'm sure we've let this set long enough. Let's pull it off the fire and set this aside so it can cool off enough that I can take the pie out of the oven. I'll take a quick gander here, set the lid aside. There's a lot of steam in there. Look at that. There you go. I'll let that cool off a minute before we uh, take it out. I can't wait to cut these open and try them. They smell really good. Hmm. These are excellent. Yeah, definitely. You should try something like this. If this isn't a normal thing for you, step out of your normal, uh, comfortable cooking. Get into something like this, a uh, uh, meat pies or something that's a little bit different. Everybody will enjoy it. Many different 18th century recipes and a lot of writings refer to something called ketchup. Now, ketchup in the 18th century wasn't uh, so much like this uh, as it is more like this. The word ketchup finds its roots in 17th century China. The Chinese had a, uh, a similar sounding name for a concoction that consisted of pickled fish and spices. The British traders uh, found this um, seasoning to be delightful. They brought it home and it quickly became the staple of the English and American diet. Today we're going to make an 18th century uh, ketchup recipe with mushrooms. This would be a seasoning or a flavor that uh, 18th century soldiers would be very familiar with. 
James Townsend and Son carries all the equipment we'll be using today, and you can find each one of these things in our catalog or on our website. We're starting off with two pounds of fresh mushrooms, but first, a word of warning. We're using common brown mushrooms in our recipe today. These mushrooms are native throughout Europe and North America, but even common mushrooms can easily be mistaken for poisonous or even deadly varieties. So, make sure to use something you know is completely safe. With our mushrooms, we need to gently uh, wipe these mushrooms off. We don't want to rinse them off or wash them because that added liquid would dilute our final flavors. And we're going to add these to our tin cooking pot. We need to draw the juices out of our chopped up mushrooms. The best way to do that is to add a couple of spoonfuls of salt. In addition to that salt, we're going to add a couple of bay leaves. We're going to mash it up, smoosh these mushrooms down in. And then we're going to cover it and then let it set for about 10 minutes. We've let these set 10 minutes and they've already started uh, reducing. The, the liquid's being drawn out of the mushrooms and it's already reduced in size a little bit. I'm going to transfer these into uh, a milk pan here. And then we can let this, uh, let this sit overnight. I'm going to put this pie pan on top just to keep the critters out. The first recipe for tomato ketchup was in 1801. But tomato ketchup did not become popular until the mid-19th century. Uh, the uh, tomato plant is a member of the deadly nightshade family, and many people considered it a deadly poison in the 18th century. Well, let's take a look. There we have it. Mushrooms have uh, completely masticated, and uh, now it's time for the next step. So now it's time to add in uh, one chopped up onion, uh, the zest of one lemon, and some uh, one tablespoon of finely grated horseradish. James Townsend and Son offers a pocket spice kit. It comes with salt and pepper, cinnamon, cayenne, and thyme. It also comes with an empty vial, and in that vial I've added cloves. In the recipe here, we're going to use a quarter teaspoon of cloves. We're going to use a, a pinch of cayenne and some allspice also, about a half a teaspoon. And the last ingredient we need is a quarter to a half a cup of cider vinegar. We're going to stir up uh, all these things together, and then we're going to put this over the fire and let it simmer for about 15 minutes. Joseph Plum Martin's book, uh, sometimes called Private Yankee Doodle, uh, many times it mentions uh, when he's eating that they're lacking sauce for their meat. More than likely, this is what he was craving. Uh, this is done simmering now. I've let it cool a little bit, but now it's time to pour it off. And I've got our uh, milk pan and I've got a, a squeeze cloth here. I'm going to pour this in here and to let it cool. Once this is cooled off, we're going to take that cloth and uh, bundle it up and squeeze all the liquid out. There's some amazing complex flavors in this. Uh, you get the salt first, uh, then some of the other spices, uh, the earthiness of the mushrooms. It's very complex, a very wonderful flavor. Uh, we're going to cork this up, we're going to bottle it, cork it, and save it for our uh, future recipes. So when you're done with the, uh, the squeezing out the mushrooms, you don't want to get rid of that. You don't want to throw that out. That is especially good stuff. You dry that and you can either uh, uh, leave it like it is or you can grind it up. Uh, some of this stuff you can sprinkle it almost like salt. Um, it is really, really good stuff. Today we're going to be making uh, wigs. Not the uh, hairy sort to put on your head, but a, a sweet little biscuit that was very popular in the 17th and 18th century. We're going to be baking some in our uh, earthen oven and some in a Dutch oven also.
The term wig comes from an earlier Dutch word uh, meaning wedge. The, uh, the loaves were uh, cut into wedge shapes for baking. Because the wigs were uh, probably fairly expensive, they have a lot of sugar and milk fat in them, and uh, they were usually set aside for special events, like uh, funerals or, or for Lent. But there's even one account of a man using them to pay his servants with them. Wigs are a yeast bread. Yeast in the 18th century was much appreciated by uh, brewers and, and bakers. Uh, a little bit of uh, yeast and, and barley malt turns into ale. Um, flour and water and yeast turns into bread. It wasn't until the 19th century that anyone really understood what was going on with yeast and how it worked. Bakers needed yeast and they knew the best place to get it was from the brewer. 18th century recipes call for liquid yeast, something a little different than modern yeast recipes. The yeast in the 18th century was either the yeast that was on the foam at the top of the beer barrel when they uh, first start brewing it. it, it comes out on the foam, which is croissant, or there's the yeast that falls to the bottom after it's done brewing and after they pull, uh, they bottle the beer off, what's left in the bottom of the barrel is the yeast that's left over, the brewer's yeast. That would be reactivated with a little bit of sugar and used in bread recipes. Unless you're a home brewer, barm can be a little difficult to come by. So we're gonna show you how to make an 18th century barm. We're gonna need a few things to make our barm. You're gonna need a bottle. You're gonna need some uh, good clean water. Uh, we've got some ale here and some sugar and yeast. I put about a cup or a quarter of a cup or maybe a half a cup of flour into the bottle. Um, and now we're going to add about a half a pint of water and half a pint of our ale. And if you don't have access to a good homebrew ale, you're going to want to buy uh, some good imported ale. The ale is going to add a very authentic flavor to your wigs. Now it's time to add to our mixture about a teaspoon of dry active yeast and a teaspoon of sugar to kickstart the mix. Now let's mix this up, get the, uh, get the flour mixed up in, in our uh, liquids, and then we're going to let this set and prime for about 15 minutes while we prepare the rest of our ingredients. While our barm is priming, let's get together uh, the, our dry ingredients for the wigs. We're going to need to start off with about four cups of fine white flour. You're also gonna need about uh, four ounces or half a cup of sugar. I've got some loaf sugar here. And we're also gonna need caraway seeds. Caraway seeds were very popular uh, flavoring in the 18th century for bread type products. These are actually caraway pods, not seeds, but. Now let's mix our wet ingredients. I've got uh, about six tablespoons of melted butter. Let's put in a uh, half a cup of uh, milk in with that. And now we need our barm. This has been priming. It's looking like it's good and alive. So give us a good shake. And then we're gonna need about a half a cup. Okay, here's our uh, wet ingredients. We're gonna put these into our dry ingredients. And then I'm gonna mix this up with my hands. You want to make sure to mix it well, but don't over mix it. Okay, that's mixed pretty well. Let's go turn this out onto the table. Let's turn our dough out onto our lightly floured surface that you've got prepared. Get all the dough out. I'm going to square this up so that I can cut it out, cut it uh, down into about egg-sized pieces. You want to make sure that you don't need this too much or you'll toughen the dough. It won't be nice and light and fluffy. Now that we've cut these into a little egg-sized shapes, we want to 
roll these into a little ball. You want to do this very gently, uh, not kneading them or making them tough. So we're going to very gently cradle these into very small round bun shapes. Now it's time to cut these into our little wedge shapes. Just going to slice them. Okay, now that we've got these cut, we're gonna put these on a, uh, a well-greased uh, sheet, a cooking sheet, and we're gonna cover them up with a cloth and let them rest for about 15 or 20, or actually a half hour. They're not going to rise because of uh, the milk fat and everything that's in them, but they do need to rest. Well, we've let these uh, rest for about a half hour. They haven't risen, they've just rested. Uh, they will spring up in the oven when they go in, they'll puff up. Uh, when we cook them, but right now they haven't risen. Next, we're going to sprinkle the tops with some searced sugar, which is, in the 18th century terms, a sifted sugar, or as we know it today, powdered sugar. Uh, your oven temperature is going to need to be a, a medium hot oven, maybe about 400 degrees. Um, for extra information about how to use these earthen ovens, make sure to check out the uh, video series where we talk about building and using the uh, earthen oven. Because there's so much sugar in these guys, uh, you're going to want to make sure that you have a trivet or maybe some S-hooks to put your, uh, your tray on because they are susceptible to burning on the bottom. There we go. We're gonna let these cook for about 15 minutes. Uh, while these are cooking, we're gonna uh, cook some in the Dutch oven. So you'll wanna watch these cook because depending on the heat of your oven, they may only take five minutes to cook. I've got the Dutch oven preheated up so that it's not stone cold. I'm gonna get the, uh, the bed of coals here uh, prepped for the Dutch oven. I wanna make sure there's just a, a ring of nice hot coals around the outside of the bottom. Again, it can be difficult to judge the temperature, the exact temperature in your Dutch oven, so you're gonna to need to check it fairly frequently to make sure they don't burn. Uh, obviously, they're just about right. Let's go ahead and take this off of the fire, and we'll get them out of here. In the past, we've done a number of different episodes on cooking 18th century uh, items and how easy that is. We thought uh, now would be a good time to uh, step back once again and uh, kind of have a little bit of a reality check about what it was really like for soldiers in the 18th century. For a soldier in the 18th century, food was, was a great concern, a great difficulty. Uh, what would a soldier do with his ration of meat if he didn't have any equipment? What would he do if he didn't have any utensils or even any wood for his fire? By most accounts, uh, the only equipment that was ever issued uh, to soldiers for cooking was the tin cooking pot. And that undoubtedly uh, really restricted the kind of foods or the kind of ways that they would be able to uh, cook their meat ration. This definitely would have restricted the cooking to mostly boiling. Uh, you can imagine just how unskilled these soldiers would have been at uh, cooking meat. In fact, uh, there are period accounts where officers are discussing just uh, how uh, unskilled the soldiers are, the ones that are put in charge of the cooking. 
Another problem was the condition of the meat that they were given as the ration. The ration was either given as, as uh, fresh meat or salted meat. The salted meat kept for a lot longer, but it also made the, uh, the meat very hard and uh, inedible until it was first soaked really well. The uh, salt was also a problem. Getting salt, the, the uh, British forces went after salt specifically, trying to restrict the amount of salt that the, uh, the colonists were able to get during the war. It became so scarce, it was more scarce than gunpowder. In David DeWitt's book, uh, Founding Foodies, he tells us that early in the war, the British cut off American trade with the Turk Islands, which was the uh, premier supplier of salt to the colonies. And then in 1776, General Howe uh, invaded and took over uh, Long Island, further reducing the colonists' uh, salt supplies and their ability to get salt. General Washington's armies were completely cut off from their supply of coastal salt, and uh, all their reserves were gone. Profiteers began to hoard the salt, and by 1783, the price of salt had raised 16-fold. So it's no wonder when we read accounts like uh, Joseph Plum Martin's journal, where he writes, I strolled into a large yard where was several sawmills and a gristmill. And I went into the latter, thinking it was probable that the dust made there was more palatable than that made in the former. But I found nothing there to satisfy my hunger. But there was a barrel standing behind the door which had some salt in it. Salt was as valuable as gold with the soldiers. I filled my pockets with it and went out. Salt was needed to preserve the meat. So if salt wasn't available, most likely they would have been issued fresh meat. The problem is their fresh meat wouldn't be anything like the aged beef that we are used to when we go to the grocery store today. Uh, their, their cuts would have been very tough meat to start with. And of course the soldiers are given the worst of the cuts available. Excavations at uh, Valley Forge suggest that the soldiers were giving cow's feet as their meat ration. There's a great account from uh, Jacob Walter's Napoleonic uh, war diary uh, where he talks about some of the salt ration that the troops were issued. The, war, uh, the year is 1812. Uh, let's, uh, let's hear what he says. He says, however, we had to prepare our own food from our rationed meat and bread. The meat came from the salted ice pits. There was a rumor that, that it had been stored from the war of 1807. The condition of the meat made the rumor seem credible since the meat appeared bluish black and was as salty as herrings. It was already tender enough to eat, and we boiled it a few times only to draw off the muriatic acid. And then the broth, not being useful for soup, had to be thrown out. So on campaign, boiling would have been the technique most likely used. And if uh, equipment was lacking, well then it would have been uh, roasting and broiling. Joseph Plum Martin writes about the uh, 1770 campaign. Here we procured a day's rations of southern salt pork, three quarters of a pound, and a pound of sea bread. We marched a little distance and stopped to refresh ourselves. We kindled some fires in the road and some broiled their meat. As for myself, I ate mine raw. So we've taken our salt pork ration today and we're, we're gonna boil it up. Josh wanted one piece that was roasted, so he's got one piece roasting and uh, we'll have this later on. Today we're going to bake beans. Beans were a common fare in the 18th century, both for uh, regular folks and uh, part of the soldiers' rations. We're going to bake beans in the oven today, and we're going to bake beans uh, buried in a pit. It was common practice in New England for the, the village baker to heat up his oven, uh, bake his bread and other items, and then at the end of the day, everyone would bring their bean pots and they'd put it in the oven and it would stay in overnight to bake the beans, especially on Saturday night. So on Sunday, everyone had beans to eat and they didn't have to work on the Sabbath. Soldiers didn't have ovens to work with, so they'd have to use whatever they had on hand. We're gonna dig a hole uh, so that we can bake our beans inside of a fire pit, down inside the earth.
We're looking for a hole in the ground that's about twice as big as our the pot we're going to cook in and a little bit deeper than the pot so we can have coals underneath and on top. So while our oven's uh, heating up, I'm gonna go ahead and start a fire in this pit. While our fires are burning down to coals, let's talk about beans. Uh, soaking your beans is a very good idea. It helps them uh, uh, cook uh, for a lot less time. You also should boil your beans. Dry beans have a toxin in them that uh, causes issues with digestion if they aren't heated to the right temperature. So if, if they're baked at a very low temperature, that doesn't get rid of the toxins and you need to boil them first. Well, I had our beans uh, boiling. These have boiled for uh, quite a while. You can boil an hour or whatever it takes. You get them nice and soft and, and ready to bake. Uh, we're gonna do, use two different methods of baking. And we're going to flavor these two batches in, in two different ways. Let's divide our beans up into our two different cooking vessels. We have our new uh, Redware bean pot that you can find on our website. And we also are gonna use one of our two quart pots and uh, we have one of these uh, new um, metal lids for them that are available that'll be perfect for this sort of operation. Anyway, let's get these divided out. First thing we're gonna put into these, they're both gonna get some salt pork. You can use authentic style salt, salt pork like we cover in one of our videos. You can also use bacon or salt pork that you find in the grocery store, but they're both rather uh, greasy, fatty, uh, so you, you would want to cut back on how much you'd use. If you use authentic salt pork, you want to make sure to soak it for an hour or two to reduce the saltiness. Now we're going to put in mustard. Both of these uh, dry mustard is a, a very common, uh, you see it in almost every recipe for baked beans. And we're going to need a, a good uh, big spoonful in each one of these pots. Both our beans recipes use uh, a sweetener. In this one we're going to use a, a molasses, and this one some um, maple syrup. Both of those very common sweeteners. We're going to use about a cup. You want to use a Barbados molasses. You don't want to use blackstrap Barbados molasses or, or light uh, molasses. It's going to have a lot better taste than blackstrap, which is very bitter. And for the maple beans, you want to make sure to use about a half a cup of authentic maple syrup. And in both pots, a quarter teaspoon of pepper here, not one of these spoons, uh, or you'll, you'd do too much. So don't go crazy with pepper. And we need some onions in here. We're going to use about half of these, maybe a half a cup or a quarter cup of, of onions. We want to get all the stuff mixed well. Push down to the bottom, mixed well. Let's get both of these stirred up. Now let's top these up with water. Don't be afraid to put uh, too much water in. It's going to boil or it's going to uh, bake off, so you want to have both of these topped off with water. Okay, there we go should be enough water. Our fires look, both places look like they're ready to go. Let's start with our oven uh, baked beans first. Our oven's good and hot. In a previous video we've shown you how to build one of these ovens and how to fire it and bake bread in it. We actually suggest you go ahead and bake bread in the oven before you put beans in it. You don't want it to be too hot. We're gonna let these uh, beans bake. You can bake them in an oven like this for four or six, eight hours, even 12 hours. Uh, the longer the better, and they really start to taste good. You might wanna check them after just a couple of hours to make sure there's still some liquid in there. You don't want them baking out too dry. You might need to add a little water. <sighs> Gotta make some room in our fire pit to put this other pot down inside the coals. We're gonna make sure you've got coals on all sides, coals on the bottom, hot coals on all the way around each side. Then you wanna have a, 
a little rock that you can put on top of the lid to make sure it doesn't get knocked off. Now we're gonna put coals up on top. We're gonna go ahead and build a fire up on top of this so that uh, so it's got more heat. The uh, beans have been in here about uh, three or four hours, so we're gonna go ahead and pull them out now. They could probably cook a lot longer, but let's get these out of here. Well, let's take a look. Looks, whoa, they look really good. These have cooked uh, for about four hours, so they're they're ready to eat right now. If we want them to be even better, we can let them cook longer, another four hours or, or even uh, another eight hours, and they'll really start to darken up, but these are ready to eat just like this. These maple beans have been in the embers for several hours. I think they're done, let's take them out. There we have uh, our uh, molasses uh, baked beans and our maple um, maple flavored baked beans. Both of these uh, we let cook for quite a while. Uh, there's a lot of latitude here in how long we're going to bake our beans. You, they've already been pre-cooked when we uh, put them in. We've already been boiled, so you know they're only going to get softer and better tasting the longer you cook them. We put in uh, the the raw salt pork. So you're definitely want to make going to make sure that that gets cooked. So you want to bake them at least two hours, at the very bare minimum. Um, four hours is good, and all the way up to 12 hours. They're only going to get tasting a little bit better. You just need to check on their moisture levels occasionally, make sure they don't get too dry. Another uh, hint on this, on these bean pots, when you're using especially the molasses, they want to boil over, and then this uh, molasses stuff gets stuck between the lid of the pot and, and the body, and they can be really hard to get off. You don't want to break break your pot and break the lid. So you want to either grease the uh, this this lid here so that it doesn't uh, get stuck, or you want to make sure to uh, wipe those down when you check on the moisture level. These beans have a flavor that you cannot get anyplace else. I really recommend you try a couple of these bean recipes. They're really good. Good food is really important. Uh, the public is going to be more interested in food when you've got really good food and you're cooking. Uh, recruits, if you want people to you know, join your group, really good food is what's going to bring them in. That's a really important part. And you want to have fun when you're reenacting. And probably the most important part of having fun is having really good food. So I encourage everyone to do more period cooking in a, at events, I think you'll really enjoy it.